The mother's injuries are handed down to the daughter. So says Ava, a mousy reverend's wife to her haughty mother Charlotte, a concert pianist with chronic back pain and a fear of her own family, including her disabled daughter Helena, whose rapidly declining health haunts the avoidant matriarch. Injuries and illness in Autumn Sonata are never incidental. They tell stories of denial, resentment, feelings forced down. A late career masterpiece for both Bergmans, Ingrid, the aging Scandinavian angel coming home from Hollywood, and Ingmar, the restless auteur in exile over tax disputes. Despite a dialogue-heavy script, continuity of place, and powerful performances, Bergman's cinematic instincts pierce through the theatrics, in particular his trademark double close-ups, some startling scene transitions, and of course, the memorable musical interlude, where Chopin's prelude number two pits daughter against mother, a humiliation hiding as mentorship. I'm back with my loyal pod brother, Owen. We've <laughs> seen, um, I've seen this film a bunch of times. Um, yeah. Owen, this... Uh, first seeing. First, first seeing. Sorry. Actually, yeah, I did, broke at the ice on this film. Did this... I was gonna, I thought that you'd seen it loads of times, mm. so my intro, said, no, my intro no. says, did this prelude play as poignantly as ever, but, um, but it didn't necessarily. Oh, did you have to uh, do a U-turn on your... Yeah, it's a big U-turn. I, can't, I don't have it's to okay. rephrase that sentence for someone. We'll fix it in post. We'll fix it, it in post. Time. We'll fix it in post. Don't worry. Never. Be, you've got to be <laughs> greasy. You've got to what you what, what you what you are asking me is whether I felt this film was poignant. Yes. Um, basically, um, on a single viewing, is 85, 86 minutes long. It feels like a lot more, partly because it is very claustrophobic. These tight um, close-ups which often kind of obliterate um, distance between people. I actually often, think it like, feels a lot less, the duration, but anyway, Karen. Really? Okay, I f this felt long for me. I, I mean, I'll finish that thought and I'll tell you actually what I felt about it. The, the thought being, yeah, it, it, he often crushes space in a really interesting way. So it's a very shallow focus, mm. um, often where you've got two, uh, the, the mother with the daughter behind her, you know, kind of the mother looking away from camera a kind of tight close-up and the daughter just behind her it's, it, it kind of mirrors there's a lot of mirroring and match cuts um but here it's all in one scene all in one frame and you've got the daughter's face behind her it's the same thing you see when the mother's playing the preludes daughter like you'd feel each other's breath on your face mm. um watching her play the preludes um so in terms of what it does with space this is a really interesting bergman film just on that alone uh, it's a you know you'd probably call it like a chamber chamber piece right um there's like no real establishing shots and when they're very like careless when they're done actually uh because it's a really beautiful like fjord like landscape isn't it i don't it's somewhere in sweden um quite amazing to look at mm. um but he's really not interested in the, the kind of landscape like, it's not there's no pathetic fallacy there that like, the landscape and the weather and all this stuff is really relevant to him he's kind of showing off what i felt about the film is kind of ambivalence and annoyance at times um like it is a really moving portrait of of uh need um, and rejection and uh family uh kind of non-physical violence that's done to families or the perception of violence what what the daughter believes the mother has done to her what the mother believes the daughter has done to, to her in turn um which is again a very claustrophobic relationship and there's things there's moments and we'll no doubt we'll talk about them where that relationship is um explored in all its intensity um uh in a very subtle way considering the, the this is there could be no more there could be no greater um emotional moment emotional turmoil than a kind of a uh kind of at this this reckoning with a parent it's in, in, you know this would be like the most intense uh fight you might have in your life um but other times i felt it was just a bit mawkish and chaotic and badly assembled um i really feel like bergman was tr trying to say something else with this film like I think he was taking aim at certain things in himself and other people around him. I have no basis for that apart from he was going through some financial difficulties at the time and he was kind of in exile in this period, um, vaguely. And there's other films around his time like Cries and Whispers 
um, which are often about recriminations and frailty and guilt and accusations. It's like a very accusatory film. It's always in the accusatory mode. Uh, it's a very cynical film. Um, and there's moments I, I really loved, like there's moments that I felt were deeply affecting and moving. Um, yeah, especially this gold burnished kind of high brass that the film was shot in. It's an amazingly rich um, grade on the film. Um, what I mean, your, your, what are your feelings? You've seen a whole lot more Bergman than I have, and for a lot longer, actually. So maybe you can position this. Uh, does that give you some distance from it? Um, yeah, it, I mean, it's a, it's a well loved film for me. I've seen it loads of times. I think maybe when you like a director as much as I like Bergman, some of the pleasure is when you see that director really hone in on a particular theme. Um, mm. That's kind of beautiful. I feel um yeah. I feel very sympathetic to the sort of um the parental dynamic and the mm. um it's I mean it's not a dynamic that's like particularly comparable in my family, but the I recognise a lot of those ways in which people avoid you know, avoid things with their children and with their parents and how resentment builds up into this kind of reckoning that you see in the film um i think it is kind of you said mawkish i guess it is it is a melodrama in some ways i mean the way that the disabled yeah the way that the disabled child yeah. kind of becomes a sort of a kind of emotional canary in the coal mine kind of sc sc Literally yelling, and, yelling and, screaming and squawking and screaming as a sort of like reflection um, of the the intensity between the mother and the daughter. Um, there's like lots of fourth wall breaking, like people looking right from the start, people addressing camera addressing and camera, telling yeah. you like what they're feeling or what's going on, which is something Bergman had already done. It that might be why I didn't like yeah, it. Yeah, like Bergman had, had already Actually. done. Like there's this film, Passion of Anna by Bergman, where where like the actors there are just scenes before each scene where the actor will tell you like what they think of their character so like Max von Sydow's like I think at the moment mm. he's doing this um I love Liv Ullman and um uh Ingrid Bergman I love In the way Ingrid that Bergen, when she's yeah. just like Nasek. clutching her lower back as soon as she comes out of the car it's just evoked the emotional connection mm -hmm. is evoked very clearly through these things that are very cinematic. This is why, like, I just get absolutely incandescent when people say that Bergman mm -hmm. is just like filming plays. Um, oh no, I, I this was going through my head when I was watching it as well because, yeah, the, we've had a conversation about this recently, you know, and in some ways you could say all, you know, in all films are, you know, what makes a film cinematic, um. There's no doubt about this. You know, it's very monologue heavy. Um, even the mother, when she's in bed, in the, her bedroom on her own, she's got this continuing rolling monologue. And some people say it's like the uh, keeping the mm. voices away, right? You you narrate and you you mumble and you stutter and you explain yourself. So she's full of explanations for what she's doing um, uh, when she's on her own and she's kind of addressing herself and she's got this rolling narrative. Um, and yeah, it kind of... I don't even want to get into the debate really, but you know, it kind of feels like yeah, stagey in a way, but there's, there's so much cinema in this film. Yeah, you're right. These little gest gestural things, uh, her clutching her back, um, the, the crushed shallow perspective when you've got mother and daughter, little things that, you know, the actual, even, even his use of zoom in this film, like the, the, his kind of, kind of, it's a very steady film the way it's shot, but occasionally he'll zoom into a face kind of quite erratically. And it's a real burst of um, clarity, actually. It's one of the things I quite liked about it. Um, even though they're done in quite a, almost a unst unstudied, uh, you know, undisciplined hand. Because um, there's not many moments, right? Do you know what I mean? Like where he's just kind of suddenly tracks the camera over and zooms in mm. and pulls in a bit on a face. And it's got like a, it's almost like a kind of Beverly Hills cop vibe. You know, someone's pulling a gun out of their, mm. out of a jacket or something, the camera's going to zoom in on it. It's got this kind of like un untutoredness to it, which um, is very cinematic. Um, but I mean, you, so you said, you know, it, you recognise things in it. Does that reflect more, 
I suppose more widely how why, one of the reasons you connect to film because you're like looking for analogs and uh, parallels and not personally because like I say like I don't um, mm. my neither of my parents are particularly like her and also like I'm not a woman but um, it <laughs> but like. <laughs> They weren't after that, <laughs> but um, but like it's it's just um, it's just that general energy between parent and child. What you're mm. asking for from a parent, uh, where, and the way that you build up yeah. the confidence to confront a parent, and how kind of flailing and faltering that can be. Um, yeah. The the attempt the attempt to make things okay in families um the of the avoidance mm. i mean the uh the sort of yeah the way that she avoids her daughter's emotional baggage basically um mm. is and then the daughter i mean i do find the daughter very unsympathetic i do find her like an annoying bitch a lot of the yeah. time but like <laughs> but like i think it's gone go gone because of her, because she's, because she's needy. You because know? she's gone. And, but it, but the, you understand. But you in in the mm. film you understand why she's needy. And sometimes I watch this film and I just yeah. I, I do feel like the mother is, is a is a bit is a is a horrendous person. Is like a monster, you know. And then sometimes I watch the film mm. and I just think the the daughter is just pathetic and and like. Yeah, I think one of the interesting films th films things about this film is that. The daughter doesn't necessarily make the best case and the mother doesn't make the best case. It's not like um, the daughter spilling forth about how her mother was a terrible parent and an awful woman and a monster. When she actually lays out the relationship, a lot of it is just not indifference. It's, it, it's met by the force of the mother's own confessions about the difficulty she was experiencing and her own... She, uh, you, she kind of clarifies as quite a sympathetic figure. The daughter's assault on her isn't successful necessarily. Um, you come away with a deeper mm. respect and understanding for the mother. You recognise the ways in which she was a bad woman, but there's no gotcha red hand mm. moment yeah, where yeah. it's like, you did this. You know, a lazier film would have said, you beat me or you raped me or mm. you looked away while I was being sexually abused or something. There's none of that, it, it, which is good to its credit because it's w when you actually see the cards on the table... All you can say is that you're. You the daughter both does try and suggest that the um, the um, sister's disability is caused by the mother's neglect. At one point. Yeah, which is bullshit. I I, I had to kind of I kind of t double back there because the disability it's the claim that the mother left and the daughter. Um, it's a bit of a weird. I hate to point out continuity of the films, but it seems to hinge quite importantly on that moment. Uh, but there, the daughter is already sick. The young Helena is already sick because when. Uh, there's, there's a flashback and she says you couldn't eat that night while they were listening to music you mm. couldn't even recognise Helena's illness and then a bit later she's like when you left that's when Helena got ill um, there's these kind of inconsistencies and I'm, I don't know if that was uh, an elision on behalf of the daughter or a kind I don't of think it's a mistake I think mistake that there's, that, well, there's a suggestion that the illness um, got better and then, it, and then it got worse that there's some sort of psychosomatic thing going on mm. with the illness I mean, it's 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 not yeah. unprecedented for you know physical physical like long term physical health conditions to result mm. from people being immensely stressed, you know, emotional, um, yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, it makes a huge amount of sense true. for someone to, <clears throat> but it also just makes a huge amount of sense because people love to blame each other for things um, because it's it's a it's a mm. way of feeling. Yeah, adding self satisfaction to feeling bad, recrimination. I mean, because that 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 was a uh, cries and whispers, isn't it? A somebody recounting the wrongs that somebody's done yeah. to them, and they don't re they don't remember. Um, whereas here, people kind of the difference is people not quite remembering the same story. I think the interesting for me, one thing I want to talk about is the flashbacks because I fucking hated the flashbacks. Um, I really feel that the film didn't need them because it had this crushed shallow depth this chamber piece of observing this confrontation now it almost weakens 
the film by having to show us. It's like, you know, when I was a little girl, I used to wait outside your room while you're playing piano. Uh, and then I would go in when you had your coffee break and you dismiss me. And this is one of the reasons she's hurt as a child because her mother wasn't able, didn't want to give her this love that the daughter needed. I didn't need to see that. There's another one where the daughter's talking about, you know, you told me I looked like a boy and I hated my and she has like body dysmorphia right she's like i hated my body i felt i was ugly whereas you were beautiful and then we see the little girl kind of looking in the mirror kind of upset looking at herself and i feel those moments were too blatant like i don't right. need to see that you told me it's there like i want to see your face telling it now that's where the the, the truth is is you I telling mean, me you now i don't need faces, to see you see their faces telling a lot of stuff i wanted it to be all that you know <laughs> commit to this, this is why piece, people don't. people who don't like the fl flashbacks always really like scenes from a marriage because mm. scenes from marriage is entirely just people talking yeah which i which i wanted <laughs> really, I which really is more which is more theatrical strangely <laughs> maybe you're mm. thinking it should just be what it is i mean i yeah. do, i as as a lover of this film it's in my top 10 films of all time i i, I think it mm. and it doesn't the weird thing is not a lot of the films in my top 10 aren't like perfect films but they're films that like no. in one regard are utterly extraordinary um and so i can i feel like i can say that the flashbacks in this film i accept them i think i really like their aesthetic mm. subtlety they're all wide shots they have a con an aura about them that's very different from the aura of the you know the intense they're, paint, they're the more painterly moment. than they're the, um, painterly, exactly. the present yeah yeah they uh, don't really the feel like the way memories feel that's my main beef with them because i know th there's no dream logic yeah we don't we don't not that you we need don't remember like a dissolve, in, but... in wide shots generally especially not those <laughs> <took me> <laughs> it's very, but no but especially those wide shots that are like from the view of an audience onto a stage basically yeah no one um, like no one recalls their dreams in that way dreams are much more immersive so it is a bit odd that they're, they're much more impressionistic yeah. i think i think it was almost too perfect you know <clears throat> yeah sorry go on just like i just was thinking you know whenever you think about dreams in film you think about mirror by tarkovsky because it's the best film to ever do yeah. dreams and it's not mm -hmm. even dreams it's beyond that it's like yeah like life just time disrupted um and i guess what he does is 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 much more impressionistic and is it, it it removed from a kind of the the from the kind of narrative logic that Bergman operates under, which is pretty linear, um, and mm. is about someone trying to figure out how to express themselves. I mean, pretty much every yeah. Bergman film since he kind of started making good films is like mm. people trying to express themselves. Um, or trying to find a a express themselves or trying to rationalize something in the world mm. that doesn't sit right with them think about winter light which is my favorite bergman film yeah. uh, it was my first bergman film and it's always remained the one that uh the yardstick against which i've measured the others fairly or not um uh, and that's a much more conventionally cinematic film um, I feel it's in a way this one has a weirdness to it and maybe the but it's got tons of dialogue in it right like it's got loads like of dialogue the, the confession in the church two people yeah. talking mm. two people talking a priest and a man you know and and I, I think one of the it is called Trebek it's it is in a way time timeless lifted out of any particular time or space and I think there's clever ways that Bergman does this one of them is that you can't it's quite difficult to ju judge the daughter, the disabled daughter's age on how much time has passed. Um, for one thing, the mother also seems much more youthful and full of life than the daughter, you know, who's living this this remote exile, basically, with this um, uh, pastor, you know, priest, or whatever, man of the cloth. Um, it's hard to piece together the narrative of her life. Um, when he does that piece to camera at the very beginning, you know, he talks about years she was with him, years she left, engaged to another man, wrote these books, became a journalist. The, the, there's this dilation. He's uh, a bit of a weakling, to be fair. He is a bit of a weakling. He's this kind of like observer. Um, and I was reading one review where like, the husband wisely chooses not to intervene. And I said, like, I'm not sure if it was wise to kind of stay out of it because he, he's, he's this kind of he acknowledges that the daughter doesn't love him just um, every time i see the film mm. i see his face 
because it's he's in the opening scene, and yeah. I think, oh god, yeah, he, she's got a husband, doesn't she? And, <laughs> yeah. And I so um, I like you just you just remember when you remember Awesome Sonata, you remember the two women, like, and you remember mm. the disabled daughter. Um, yeah. But like, yeah, that's like he's like annoyingly he is useful for the plot in it in that he sort of opens things out a bit and he allows mm. even though they you don't really need a, an extra character to open up those things because people are already breaking the fourth wall but like yeah. he yeah. allows he allows certain conversations to happen by kind of being around and me- remembering mm. things for people and you know when they're in the looking at the slides and stuff um, yeah, he, t- he, t- he tells us about the the dead son, really Frederick, yeah. whatever his name is. And Eric, he, he ex- Eric, sorry, um, and he kind of gives us some. He he confides in the mother. I mean, there's a lot of misremembering about how people are. I mean, one of the interesting things is that um, the daughter says, the mother says to the daughter, "Oh, your husband said he didn't love you." She's very surprised by this, not because she does love him or doesn't but he says well he rarely confides in people it's like well, he seems pretty a pretty confidential chap like you know it, the mother who's never met before one of the first facts he tells her is about his complex unusual relationship with um her daughter um and i think there's a lot of people think thinking differently about those close to them um, mis- misremembering. I don't think it's a film that explores misremembering, but it is there. The, the image you have of another person um, in truth doesn't necessarily survive its exposure to reality. That feels like the, mm. the, the red thread that links this film. You know, the image that the daughter has of the mother as this strong, beautiful, talented, cosmopolitan woman kind of falls apart and we realise the mother's had this quite difficult career and it's this congenital back problem and um the her affairs and her difficulties in her life her period when she suffered a lot of um humiliation in her career um because she couldn't perform as well as she used to you know mm. the, the the image that people have other people the perception kind of uh, shatters a bit yeah it's um, a great sort of portrayal of a kind of chain of approval and and shame mm. and and um, people, you know, what do you think about needing love? What do you think about the? the I mean, I can't remember we're jumping all over the place here, but I think I kind of want to talk about the uh, the disabled daughter a bit. Um, because I'm saying, what well, was that hashtag problematic? Not at all. Um, sections with her, there's a moment where she kind of crawls out of bed while the mother and daughter are arguing, and she kind of yells out the stairs, Mother, um, uh. What am, I, what am I trying to say? I mean, the, the disabled, like I say, the disabled daughter is a canary in the coal mine for their the mm. emotional, the repression between the mother and daughter, because because she's, she's like the the, the, the the rebel yell. Well, yeah, because she's, she's declined into a pre-verbal like, state, right, um, mm, or yeah. a non-verbal state or whatever. So she's or she's just because she can't be all sort of articulate and thoughtful. She's kind of imprisoned by this condition Mm. so then her expressions are more necessarily more emotive because they more more, guttural and and violent i think yeah um and so yeah she's like just a device really i guess there's also this this thing about how you know the the mother has like has abandoned her like doesn't want to spend you know wants to just Mm. put her in a home and forget about her and the daughter is said, "Oh, you know, we, no, we brought her into the home, into the house. We want to care for her." Um, and so there's a there's an interesting contrast there between someone who, you know, and you wonder, does the daughter really want to care for the for her sister, or does she want mm. to to kind of have a moral high ground over her mother, despite you know, her mother. Because she doesn't tell exactly. her the mother that she's there. Not that it should matter, but the mother feels the the thing that precipitates their confrontation is that she doesn't notify her mother that the well, daughter is there. Yeah, and she says, there. "Well, if well, if I and told you, you would come," and she's like, "Oh, that's not true." But it immediately yeah. is true. It immediately is true because of that, and it, it's also she uses it a chance to bash. So, in a way, Bergman uses the disabled daughter as a device. The characters also use her as a totally. device. Um, um, it's kind of happening from all sides, really. You know, the there is a. It, she uses it as a recrimination. She says, "Well, I did write to you to say that Helena was moving in with us, but you probably didn't read the letter." And there's these moments to, you know, accuse. This is like an accusatory film. That's the register it's at. And the, in a way, the daughter before, prior to the the confrontation happening after dinner, um, there is 
a moment where we keep seeing a daughter pop into like the living room and it's almost done in this kind of bunuel esque like comedy of manners because she's like oh i bet mother will wear something spectacular for dinner because that's what she would do because she doesn't want us to think that she's in mourning or, or something and she says all the and she makes all these kind of snide remarks she's before the mother's really done it set a foot wrong the daughter is already kind of roughing up the ground yeah i mean she? that's such a classic family thing isn't it right people whenever you spend mm. time with someone and their parents one of the big things you notice is that they are immediately preparing for the parent to behave in a way that they have behaved in the past. Mm. And it always feels a bit odd yeah. because you don't know the parent that well. And so you always, you're not anticipating any kind of behavior really. And so, it, and oftentimes mm. that, that, pers- that person is, is over preparing <laughs> for something because they're so, because a certain mm. set of behaviors is really ingrained. And so I think for the husband, it is yeah. like much easier to see. We do see the, we see everything through the husband's eye because the husband is not as invested as these two people. So the husband sees mm. these, t- and also especially because the husband, I mean, the one of the things I, f- that if I find problematic with the husband is, is that he knows that she doesn't love him. Yeah. And, and yet- I just think that's f- a bit like, fuck man, come on. It's a bit fucked, isn't it? Because yeah, he's he, a reverend, he, right? He's given his he, life when to he Christ. D- maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he just. Mm. Maybe I mean, he. You know, um, she lets. I don't him know if it's different in Sweden with. <laughs> but they had it. They had a kid, so they've obviously got done full raw dog. Um, and I think because even even the interesting thing about the opening, his opening piece to camera, he says he proposes to her at the, the moment, pretty much the moment she, he meets her. On a walk back to his house, he invites her back to his house. She, he proposes to her straight away, so he's obviously quite mm. needy as well. He has an emotional void which he never learned anything about. Um, maybe it's enough to know that he, his own um, intense psychodrama is happening out there somewhere else and hasn't landed here yet. He's escaping as well, and it kind of alludes to uh, maybe it, 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 it kind of neuters the the main narrative a bit. It's, you know, Bergman isn't saying that this particular family is um, bad. Is the only bad family? He's saying this is a this is what happens when you look at one family through a microscope. But what else is waiting out there? There's a lot of like dumb mute characters, often men actually. Um, there is the Paul, who is her assistant, who first we don't hear from. He's on the end of a phone. We see him at the end when he comes to pick up the mother on the train, and she is obviously trying to justify her escape um, from her daughter to him and she her moods are very switching she goes from kind of bravura and brio and confidence to to angst and neediness and she goes over to him and holds his hand and she kind of is flirting with him and acknowledging him and turning away from him but he kind of says nothing right and he falls asleep at one point <laughs> and she's like no <laughs> no no wake talking. up wake up while she's talking he's asleep and it's again one I mean, of these little slips of comedy that comes in there's him there's the father who we see flashbacks with the father and he says not a single word um I'm interested in these dumb men. Yeah, I mean, the main thing I'd say about Paul is that um, he is the priest from Winterlight, and so I can't, yeah, I can't, can't unsee that. that. His, his, his <laughs> performance in that film is so powerful that, unfortunately, all the other Bergman films he's in, I just see him as the priest from Winterlight. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. I do think there's an extended no. universe. I mean, Liv Ullman basically does always play the same character, um, pretty much. But uh, um, what were you saying about dumb men? Dumb yeah. men, yeah. What are the dumb men in this? Because there's, there's enough of them to make it um, only it's a one cl- time. Yeah, it's a, on. it's, a, it's a classic thing for a male artist to kind of focus on women's feelings and expressions because he can see them from the outside mm. with with a greater, you know, because when he, he's a, he observes women. In this very heteronormative way, he observes women, <laughs> therefore he can write them better because he's mm. not sort of invested in their outcomes. The men are, yeah, often more silent, more quiet. I don't really, when I think about Bergman, like, I can't, well, I suppose Winter Light. The, the Winter men, Light is the a men, very mask. The men in that, that film in are very sense, compelling. Yeah. But Persona, yeah. I mean, there's no men in Persona. And, um, no. And he's in, interesting in though. Summer with Monica, like, the, 
the dude is just very formulaic. What? Strawberries have got a bloke. I mean, but there's, that's a bad film. But yeah, Miles, Miles that's Strawberry. a bad film, probably. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, mild, very mild strawberries. Miles I think um, there is. Yeah, but I'm still interested in these dumb men. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe it's partly that. Maybe it's partly his own pop psychology hour, but his own frustrations and uh, and, and difficulties well, he was about expressing dead himself. Beat, He's dead now beat that. Dad. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, is, he was a famous famous parent and he, he could barely remember how many kids he had. He was just a workaholic <laughs> and he just he just yeah. um, of course I'm sure some of them ended up, you know, making mm. stuff and doing you know, benefiting from his um He's accusing himself in, yeah. in this film, I think, or, or or that's too blatant. He's accusing himself and he's also recusing himself as well he's pulling himself out of the the maelstrom in a way i think there's these silent witnesses around that are men that are interesting enough in their in their silence and their diffidence and their their fate because they are failures as well like the the father in in this film isn't really able to comfort and step up for his daughter you know he comforts her and he's like we shall have ice cream for dinner um we'll go to the cinema which i think is kind of a right kind of quite funny thing that he says wait who says that um the father well he doesn't say it but the daughter when the daughter is talking oh the, the voiceover on a dream the, sequence oh, the, when we see her what the, in, the, in, in, the, it, the reverend her I mean. dad oh, no. not the reverend the, her actual father oh, okay yeah, you know yeah. we see him in yeah. that big walnut line study and he's kind of stroking her hair he's actually a bit of a uh powerless figure as well right because he he's una- unable to s- demand of the mother to stay and to look after the daughter he's un- unable to really protect and defend the daughter um he's again this kind of silent mute witness and there's so many of these mute witness witnesses and again men you know when 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 the daughter talks she says that um the men that would come to the house while the mother was away on tour often at months at a time it would be the uncle who they just sit there in silence muttering she says i wonder if they even understood what they were saying there's the other uncle who comes over and plays chess um he's like of course they never said anything it was complete silence you could hear all four clocks in the house ticking <laughs> that's an amazing phrase uh, it was an amazing such an amazing line and i, I think there's a, such a weight of these silent dumb voiceless men like this gallery around the film watching these two women three women fucking go at it um i think that's interesting and maybe that feels whether intentional or not it feels kind of like there's lots of Bergman standing around like lots of him lots of versions of himself kind of whether he sees himself like you said as this kind of as it's part of his process it's easier to write these women as an observer remove observer or whether it's because he's kind of um acknowledging his own muteness and powerlessness um I don't know. I find it interesting. Yeah, I can't really psychologize Bergman except to say what I said about no, him being, really being a deadbeat dad. But like, yeah. it does. Yeah, Ber- Bergman's men do feel like. Yeah, they they tend to be quite solemn and quite mm. detached. Um, and but then you know, many of us are. <laughs> yeah, re- it's a repression um, sonata. Really, I think there's just. But I mean, it's extraordinary, the actual, um, I'm glad I saw it. I mean, uh, it, yeah, it's an extraordinary film. It let me, it, it let me down in places. Um, like I said, I think the, the, the disabled daughter is this kind of yorp, this kind of, um, was a bit bizarre and a bit odd. Oh, I thought I that was like good. I don't actually have a problem. The flashbacks. I don't have a problem with the daughter okay. at all. The flashbacks, I, okay. I accept because I love so much else of the film, <laughs> but I, I, yeah. I, I if I had if I had issues with other aspects of the film, I would be like, yeah, flashbacks were shit. Mm. The flashbacks, they're like, yeah. if you if you're along for the ride, the flashbacks are nice and subtle, but yeah, they don't function the way that like memory functions. They're very theatrical and odd. Mm. Um, they're idiosyncratic. Yeah, but. I like. Yeah, I like what I liked about it was these the similarities to other things I like, uh, which sometimes a good thing, sometimes a bad thing. It reminded me of Uncle Vanya. Mm. Uh, a lot actually and Uncle Vanya all Chekhov actually I mean Bergman is very Chekhovian I don't, I don't think that's like a, a hot take or anything um, there's something about Uncle Vanya uh, the clock ticking at the end and I think there was these little moments where you know Uncle Vanya is about is the, the relationship the, the house in Uncle Vanya when it returns to its state of like rural torpor at the end um as a declaration for for love and peace and finding it mm. right the 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 niece 
um, beseeches Uncle Vanya that maybe you know their day they can make their days meaningful and happy um, and full. And you kind of know that's not really true, but there's a kind of hope. Whereas I think uh, Awesome Sonata is a very cynical film. It ends at this kind of hopeless. Uh, maybe it's similar because it all kind of says, oh, "I should kill myself, but I believe God may have a task for me, and I'm needed." <laughs> a bit arrogant. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm gonna kill myself, but God might use me as an instrument. Yeah, fuck that. Um, yeah, fuck that. Um, yeah, she is. I mean, she's kind of annoying, I guess. Um, yeah. What else can one say about the film? I mean, I I just think it's so just, to me like it's it's the most Bergman film because it's about mm, like the most Bergman of yeah, Bergman yeah, films like, because it because yeah, yeah. it expresses like the 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 dark torture and pain and longing mm. for for love that happens um in silence you know that is like it's mm-hmm. like in everyday life just totally like not expressed or or and then like yeah. why didn't you tell me you it's felt a this perfect, way like it's kind yeah. of like to me that is bergman's instrument you know and it's mm-hmm. like just watching someone do a do a sonata i guess do a some a, a, a symphony that has lots of range in it you know you start mm-hmm. with her getting out of the car she's got the back pain you know you know something's up between the mother and the daughter and then it just it ramps up it becomes incredibly intense and then i love the way it just falls away the way she's just suddenly on the train um yeah uh yeah and then with the very fake kind of um very artificial moving background yeah of course that's because he was filming all that studio. i mean that you got to give him that that's his yeah. mode of production I mean, I, I yeah, I, I no, I, I think that I think that was no, I think that was intentionally a bit ramshackle, wasn't it? I don't think it was intentional. I just think, I just think it, it's just it shit. Is, yeah, I think it's. <laughs> 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 I don't think there are any films where like the use of a back projection is like deliberate aesthetically. I think it's just. Mm. I think they just had you know. I mean, uh, yeah, production uh, constraints, isn't it? Yeah. Now you can just yeah, shoot it was, anything. Um, I think. We'll see. He shot this through his uh, Persona films as well. He's through his own production company. Because yeah. uh, I think other sources of funding weren't necessarily forthcoming because he was in a financial straits at this time. Um, I think it's often seen as a cu- quite bitter period of his life, right? This, this, I mean, there's a lot of bitter periods of his life, but this one was a particularly kind of uh, adrift and abject yeah. one. Um, it's, I mean, well, how is it regarded? I feel like it is one of his best loved films, right? I think so. Yeah, 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 I think it is. I think I think for its relatability. I mean, like you said earlier, you know, even if you, your family isn't like this, you recognise patterns in in relationships that this film bears fruit for. And obviously, it's a film, so of course, it's going to exaggerate them. Um, it's not going to be oh, that time you were late from picking me up from <laughs> tennis practice. That, that was kind of annoying, actually. It's, you know, it has to be exaggerated. Um, uh, um, while I didn't like. Sometimes I felt that exaggeration was just a bit too floppy and erratic. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but you did like the bit yeah, where they play the Chopin. Yeah. Talk, talk to me about that because we, we were both. Um, so basically, yeah, we both like that, don't the we? daughter, they've got a piano in the house. Obviously, the mother is a famous concert pianist and the daughter can play piano. She's been, she says she's been practicing these um, preludes by Chopin. She plays one of them. Um, and the response from the mother is like strangely like she basically says that it she's that she's proud of the daughter and it's she's done a good job but everything else about her says mm. no you're not doing it right and and the mother knows yep. obviously because she's a really good pianist uh the daughter sorry the daughter knows mm. um like that the mother's not you know that would do, would do it differently and so eventually she sort of squeezes yeah. that out of her and she's like oh, well you know I'll, I'll, I'll just do it the way you know the way it should be done um and, and then she does it <laughs> and obviously she does play it better um gives it a different 
kind of inflection in a way a more tender inflection mm. a more emotional inflection which is this great irony because of course she's so emotionally repressed but then when she plays the piano all this emotion yeah. emotion flows out um and mm. yeah it's just and also just the and you just the, there's a lot of shots of them while the music is you know you can't you don't really see the keys being played partly because they're being played by someone else no, um, <laughs> <laughs> although there is a shot which drifts from um, the hands to the face but you do see a hand yeah but it, it, it's it's when it's playing yeah, those low bits. kind yeah, of do, stepping do, do, notes do, yeah. you know the ding 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 it's a very ugly um prelude actually it's, it's an extraordinary beautiful one but it's one that's filled with lots of um studied errors and slippages between notes and keys it's a kind of a, it's quite an unusual um one to pick actually actually it's well, the perfect yeah because there's, there's different ways um, to, there's no, noticeably different ways to play it i suppose i'm not a musicologist but that's like that mm. seems to be you do feel it quite differently the second Case, time yeah um and Case i just yeah it's not even like she plays it better it's it she plays mm. it differently and the difference is the quality of it yeah i really i really love that it's just it's just it's it's very sad but it's like you know they're trying to do they're mm. trying to do something creative and yet still like this there's this difficulty and resentment and just because obviously you know that she would have learned yeah. to play piano when she was very young so it's like takes them back to back to this moment and yeah like the the failure of the daughter really you know the daughter is you know she's failed she's failed to love she's failed to be able to love she can't love her husband uh, mm. and in a way you know maybe that's the greatest no. failure of all right not being able to love but of course it's a failure that's that one must assume has been handed down by the parent you know who, who can mm. love exactly and, and so from the parents to the son, what do you do with that son, you know i yeah. think i think anyone who's like i, th I think anyone who's ever known their parents has had moments of mm. feeling this kind of impotent frustration with them whereby you don't really yep. know you know you you want to blame them for be for not being good enough but then in saying that yep. or expressing that you're confronted with like the impossibility of of like of, of ever kind of breaking that cycle or you know <laughs> you know you realize that we you, you realize well, that we're you, totally you, constrained by all these traumas that are being passed down and that you can't really break yeah. that cycle and you conclusively but you realize you you also realize when you when you find a void or a need that hasn't been filled you also realize your own failure to give back you expect but mm. you don't give and i think the mother acknowledges as much in this right because she's like you know i didn't know how to love you i didn't know how to interpret your your needs and wants from me she was almost um inarticulate to understand human desires which again is the one of the ironies of the film because you know when she talks about chopin she's like well i've been studying i've been playing these sonatas and studying these sorry preludes for 45 years and i still mm. things i'm finding in them um, you know, I'm still discovering new things, and both both the mother and the daughter have got these kind of ironies between their creative output and their, you know, the the the, the daughter, lest we forget, as a writer, she's written a couple of small books, <laughs> as the husband calls it, kind of disparagingly, and he reads a passage from the book which is all about how I don't know how to live and be myself, but I, you have to kind of, it's almost like this like Instagram inspirational thing. It's not particularly good, but she kind of says uh, the passage he reads is like you. I must work at it and understand myself over time and maybe I'll learn who I am. I can't remember the exact passage, but it's to that effect. And obviously the daughter isn't very good at, because that passage is filled with sympathy and understanding of, of somebody's failures and um, complexities, but she ultimately can't Yeah, it's very similar to the irony of the, of the, of the um, musician being able to inflect the music with more emotion and yet she can't mm, get in touch with the emotions in her family. Can't. Um, it's a perf yeah. perfect sort of yeah, sublimation yeah, and re-channeling of things. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My favorite, my favorite. Uh, you know, when when you were talking about the, the the recital by the daughter, the best bit is actually when it looks at the mother's face and she kind of turns her head away slightly. Yeah, and then she looks pained. It's a pain that kind of washes over her, and it's it's this. That's when he's really good here. When there's a lot of like very monologue -y bits and talky bits where people really articulately say how they feel. 
Um, but it's that moment was one of the best bits for me in a way because you can see everything is there in, in the film is in this mother's pained, wincing, uh, I guess, frustration at the daughter's failure to play this prelude properly and her own awareness that she's probably a bit of a bitch if she says anything about it. The shame mm. of thinking it, maybe? Yeah, it's, 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 it's extraordinary, extraordinary performance. And interestingly, apparently, they had to reshoot loads of stuff because when she first arrived... Uh, Ingrid Bergman was over overacting it and hamming it up, and 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 Ingrid had really? to, Ingmar had to sit her down and get things out of it. Um, I feel like we've really feel like we've done it. Um, yeah, we've gone and done it. Um, I s- I'm glad we. Well, I was just I was yeah, just go gonna. Uh, there's some ha- some move to housekeeping we need to do. Um, the housekeeping. But, yeah, uh, go for it. Go, go clean, clean the house. Clean the house. Um, go and clean the floor. Tell me first, though, if you had to do another Bergman, and um, maybe we will, maybe we won't. But what would you, what would you pick? I'm kind of curious if you had to kind of dip into the Bergman a swim probably pool, you Winter out? Light because it's your favorite, and then, mm-hmm. but then I also like, I, I'd, li- I'd like to have another oh. one that we disagree about because it was really interesting us disagreeing about this one. Yeah, uh, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't disagree about Winter Does that Light because. I also think it's a masterpiece. No. Um, yeah, yeah. I, that I mean Persona, but Persona is kind of the same as Autumn awesome Sonata in a way. Um, great, I mean, mm. fantastic. Uh, might be interesting to delve into somewhere with Monica, some of the more like frivolous, erotic ones. Yeah, do some frivolous and erotic. I, mean, I, li- yeah. I like erotic Bergman actually. He's um, but Bergman strangely horny. Yeah, he definitely knew how to get his rocks off, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, very horny director for somebody who's such a studious um, Uncle Vanya figure, or likes to cut, cut himself as an uncle. He likes to cut himself as the. That's what I'm saying about all these men, you know. He likes to cut himself as this strong, silent, mute man. But actually, I think he's quite a. He's he's a real Bunuel kind of. I would like to. Re- I would really like to revisit um, Bergman, um, like to re- Cries and Whispers as well, actually, because I I haven't seen that for a while, and I remember mm. really, really liking it. Um, yes, housekeeping. This hasn't been, well, we haven't really um, formally discussed this, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm away oh. next week, and I was away last week. Oh yeah. In a, uh, <laughs> and I feel like I feel like oh. I feel like we do we have done a year of move to event. I would like to have mm. a break, a sort of summer holiday, perhaps. Um, our, f- our, f- our listeners will like, be sending you fucking hate mail. I'm I'm going to dox you to. Um, <laughs> this, this hasn't gone Ralph lives well. in a bin. Um, in no, we have unfinished <laughs> business. We have no, no, unfinished no, you business. Deserve a break. We have. Well, there's a Dumont special it's we need ghost. to do. There's a Dusan Makayevov special we need to do. There's the episode four of our Godard special. Lots of guests on all that that we want to have. Igor and Daniel yeah, returning. Yeah, yeah. George joining. Um, but just in the last week or so, I have been not really watching movies with the same zeal and zest as I have in previous months. No. And I think when you start to feel uh, less than totally enthusiastic about a project, it's good to walk away from it. Um, temporarily, though. Um, yeah. This is a breakup uh, live on air, ladies and gentlemen. It's not a breakup. It's. Uh, I agree. I well, think I still want to see you every week, to, um, right? But like, refresh. it's just not in the form of like. Um, yeah. We might loosen things a little bit. It might not be happening as regularly. Um, we might only. We might be like mood yeah. activated. We might see a movie. Um, we're just like we have to do that, when yeah. we feel like it. Um, but when we get into the swing of things, exactly, there are yeah, things. Yeah. That I would love to knots that we need to tie up. There are episodes that we've planned that we've got guests mm-hmm. for that we want to do, but. I just, yep. yeah, I just want, I want to feel what it's like to not do it every week for a few weeks. Yeah, I think it's been quite an intense roller coaster. Um, you know, well, the world is changing. Um, opening up a bit. I've been yeah. jabbed. Ralph has been jabbed. I was jabbed today. Got that yes. Pfizer running through my veins. Um, uh, you're going away to an island you're going to have your own um, I'm going to have it. hopefully Berg- it won't Bergman be of. too Bergman-esque my my little getaway no um, with, with no no it won't be um, 
I'm going away as well. Maybe next week. So next week may be silent. I may come back with another. Please do movie. actually. No, I don't. Yeah. Uh, don't let my absence um, yeah. d- 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 um, deter you from doing. I loved your Ozu episode. It was very nice while I was on strike. Yeah, I might do another ten. <laughs> You're going on strike again. I might do another ten minute um, thought piece. I might talk about Kelly oh, Reichardt's yeah. cow Please actually do. first cow because I saw it in the cinema and I want to. I want to do a, an actual movie review of a movie that great. is in cinemas That's at the idea. moment so I can cash in that money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that may be it, you know? What we're going to do now is we're going to play out this episode to um, maybe <laughs> Chopin's prelude <laughs> number two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Just yeah. to make it even more mawkish. Melancholy. Yeah, I mean, you love it. Um, you love you love a bit of melancholy. And that's melancholy. Just next oh, I love it. Your humor. I love it. I love it. I do. Great. Well, thank you for um, listening, listeners. Thank you, all right. like, for listening for a whole mm. year, some of you, to to us talking about films. Yeah. We've really enjoyed it. Um, and we yeah. will be back. We really have. Um, we'll be back, uh, but not. We'll be back, back and on um, at some point. Mm-hmm. 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 All right. Farewell. <laughs> <laughs>